Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Claudette Lejean from NYU Langone Orthopedics, and I'm talking about XR applications and, in particular, haptics in medicine and surgery. I don't have relevant disclosures. So we'll talk a little bit about what XR is, and I think we've heard some already, so I won't go into it uh, too much. But, you know, where are we now and what can we do in the future? So is the future, is this the future or the present? You know, can we map out things that are under the skin that uh, we can't see using XR? And I think the answer is yes. What is XR? So a glossary of terms here. A virtual environment is a 3D synthetic world that's viewed interactively by a user. Immersive virtual environment is the VE that surrounds the user so that you replace your physical reality with this new thing. Virtual reality is, are generally technologies which create this IVE or the experience of using an IVE. Augmented reality is an environment that combines real and virtual imagery, which is interactive and is registered. And this has been around since 1997. It's not that new. XR is any of these families of technologies, and that includes VR, AR, MR, um, and a bunch of other technologies. So mixed reality is this continuum describing these technological systems that blend real world and virtual imagery. So these are all these different kinds of technologies. The metaverse is even bigger. You know, we're pretty much here when we're talking about what we're using in, uh, in orthopedics. So what are the XR technologies? What are they made up of? You have information. You have a computer that processes the data. You have rendering software that translate the data into some interface with a user. Then the user receives that stimulus. The user responds with something, some input. And then the input device interprets what the user does. The computer processes it and adds it to its data. And then the cycle starts all over again. So when we're thinking about us being our being users and what our experience is here, we're really talking about these two sides of that coin, the rendering technology and the inputs that we give back. So how is information handed to us and how do we give it back, give back our response? So, you know, we are, when we consider users, we consider us individually and then these systems of users that can use these technologies. So XR technology is not new, but the way we use it now is pretty new. So they've been around since 1968, where the first VR glasses were attached to a ceiling. Um, and the real revolution came with the Oculus Rift uh, developmental kit one in 2013. And the old versions were $30,000 and were very heavy, and you now have these things that you can actually wear on your head. So it really was rendering an input technology that got better, and that's why people were allowed, were able to use them. So advances in rendering an input that technology is really what made this technology available to us. There's something called the Gartner Hype Cycle, which tracks new technology, and both virtual and augmented realities have become mature according to this, uh, the Gartner hype cycle. So, you know, these things are off these charts now. They're already mature. So they're technically, you know, able, ready for prime time. But where are we now with XR and VR and medical training? So, you know, we have, you know, all of this technology available. We have data, we have processing, we have rendering technology, we have the, the ability to use inputs. So we have the technology, we have people, you know, that want to use these, these technologies. And we also have systems of people that want to use them. But, you know, how do we use these technologies to learn? Because motor sequence learning, when you're a surgeon, it's a very complex process. It involves a bunch of different parts of the brain. Um, and learning something simple, a simple process like riding a bike, uh, involves these visual and spatial elements that are learned in chunks in the brain and then that are put together. And when you learn something, the tools that you use to learn should give you feedback through all of the elements of your visual, spatial, um, and proprioceptive senses. So a simple motor process is like riding a bike. But when we talk about things like surgery, it's more like racing a bike. It's higher level decision making. It's much more complex. And these decision making and complexity centers are in a different part of the brain. They're in the hippocampus. So that's where cognitive learning comes in. And cognitive learning is much less concrete and involves intuition. So we want to train us, train ourselves to have better intuition. So how do we get better memory 
from intuitive learning. So we've learned, and there are a few studies that show this, memory improves when learning involves the motor cortex. So handwritten notes, for example, are much better than typing in computer notes when you're trying to remember something. And a few studies showed this, that you know the material substrate of writing on paper gave that physical and tactile cue to the learner to remember what they were learning. Uh, one study uh, compared uh, functional MRIs of people taking handwritten notes to computer notes uh, for on functional MRI, and it showed that writing handwritten notes were better for accuracy, for activations in centers of the brain. It allowed for much better memory uh, on functional MRI, much more uh, brain activity. So it shows that using tactile feedback to learn is superior, especially when it comes to lighting up parts of the brain. And that's why these companies write, you know, have these products that describe the remarkable where you're actually writing your notes down that can be translated onto the computer because you remember better when you do this. So how do we apply this to surgical training? Here we have surgical training on the left and you know drawing and tactile feedback on the right. And I guess this is what you get when you combine the two of them. I like to talk about Colonel John Boyd when I talk about learning and surgery because he actually is the, the guy who changed the art of war. And he was a fighter pilot, a wep weapons instructor in the Air Force. And he was obsessed with tactics and decision making and how to make decisions quickly. And also he helped design several uh, fighter airplanes. Um, and he developed something called the OODA loop, O-O-D-A, as a combat operations process. And this is widely used now across many platforms. You know, what is OODA? Observe, orient, decide, act. So when you observe something, you see, okay, what are you seeing and what are you sensing? How are circumstances unfolding? And you get lots of different uh, sensory inputs when you observe something. How do you orient yourself to what you're observing? And that really takes into account everything in your life that you've ever seen or done. And then based on what you have seen and what you've oriented yourself to, you make a decision. What are you going to do? And then you also decide what you think is going to happen when I do this thing. And then you do whatever it is that you want to do. And that's your performance, either a technical act or you say something or do something. And then something happens and you have to go through this loop all over again. And this looks kind of like what our VR and XR systems look like. You have, you know, the observations, the inputs and outputs and decisions are made and it goes back to a processing center. So what Colonel Boyd learned was that it wasn't that the bigger, stronger uh, pilots would always win. It's the fighter pilots who moved through that loop faster were the ones who would win because they got a tactical advantage. Agility would beat raw power, and this is not new. This goes back to 480 BC in the Battle of Salami when the inv invincible Persian army was defeated by a much smaller fleet of more nimble Greek ships. So they had a lighter, stronger, more nimble, agile fleet that beat the bigger, stronger fleet. And this, again, has to do with how quickly um, the ships or the fighters or the surgeons can go through this loop. So how quickly can you go through? So speed and latency is what matters. So, you know, as we know, medical learning involves risk, high stress, costs, and reproducibility. And so does air combat training. So that's why I like to compare these two things because they're, they're very um, high stress and it's hard to reproduce those situations in real life. In surgery... You know, you have a lot of risk. Traditional training in the United States involves graduated responsibility, but that also involves making errors. Some learners require more repetition than others before they get it right. So a new procedure is going to involve a learning curve, uh, even for experienced people, too. So how do you learn while you minimize risk to our patients? It's, and also minimizing risk to us because we get exposed to things when we train. Um, so we did one study at our, at our place where we did a THA on cadavers. Half of them had VR training before and half had no intervention. And then they did a second cadaver session. And then we learned that there was statistically significant improvement in the technical performance, but not necessarily the knowledge of those who had VR training. Um, so we used our you know, chief residents to decide whether uh, the PG-11s needed assistance or they asked for help, couldn't progress or making a critical error. So people who went through VR training before doing these cadaver THAs did better. So where do haptics fit in? 
Again, this is not a new concept. In 2012, Luciano did a study of neurosurgery residents trying to put thoracic pedicle screws in, and they found that those who had haptic training had significantly better performance. Uh, and there was actually more skill retention. There was a trend. It wasn't statistically significant um, after practicing with haptics. So haptics made a difference in terms of learning. And we also did a, a trial of haptic uh, VR versus non-haptic VR, where we did 14 PGYN residents, where half of them were trained on VR without haptics, and half of them were trained on VR with haptics. And they were drilling through a tibia, something very simple and basic. But what we measured was how far the trainees plunged through the far cortex, both on the VR and on a sawbones after their training. And we learned that all of our trainees learned, but the haptic, haptically trained residents learned faster. They basically learned after the first repetition. Um, so VR with haptics were more consistent and they plunged significantly less on sawbones after they trained. So here's on VR, so this is on the training, those who were haptics in the light gray. So you can see the over drilling for the haptic learners was lower right away. It took the non-haptic learners a few tries before they stopped plunging uh, on their drilling. And then on the sawbones also, the haptics were very consistently uh, plunged less than the non-haptic learners. So you can see, you can be make residents safer with haptic learning and safer quicker. Because cost and efficiency is really important. When we move to the, the ambulatory surgery centers, we have to balance productivity versus education. So we need to go faster, but stay safe. So, you know, these outpatient centers, that's going to increase and outpatient surgery is not reimbursed as much. So you need to do more procedures. Um, so how do we educate trainees efficiently and safely as this type of uh, efficiency becomes more important? You know, we also have to train Doctors in new technologies. How do we, you know, rel you know, rectify the fact that it takes a whole day to certify on a new technology? Teaching staff how to use new devices or systems. Uh, these these things are expensive and they take time. So can we instead use some sort of an, a, a VR to to take over some of this training and have some reliability? So what is the cost of training people? In 2023, there were 30 articles on the use of XR for training, but all of these things, almost all of them were for procedures. There was not much on learning how to use specific devices. So this is an area of opportunity where industry can maybe partner with us to help us develop this technology. There's always a question of cost. You know, what is a, a VR headset? This was, I did this survey in uh, 2020 of our uh, residents and staff and asked them if they owned one. 21% uh, didn't even know what it was, and only 4% owned a VR headset. And then you fast forward to 2022, everyone knew what it was. 12% owned one, but everybody knew what it was. So this is just two years later. Now, this was again 2022, so I asked if they owned an AR or an MR headset, but everyone, again, knew what it was, but didn't have one. So we've, we're starting to move into a, an era where people can access the technology to learn on these, these systems. There's also a lot of administrative costs to training. You know, having a whole bunch of people trying to write evaluations and milestones is like herding cats, and you miss a lot of data. And then again, when you have a whole bunch of people evaluating residents, you have a lot of variability. Even the same evaluator can be different when, it, when he or she evaluates a different uh, resident. For instance, this was us during COVID. There were four pages of us here. So this is how large our department is. And each one of us has to evaluate residents. So all of us are going to do something a little bit different when we evaluate each resident. Um, so how can we measure and analyze our residents objectively? Well, you know, can we help? Can VR help us with that? Can we have it objectively evaluate residents? You can get reproducibility and you get metrics out of these training systems. Um, and, you know, for instance, here's a just... You can say, all right, did they do this properly? Did they answer their questions properly? You know, this is me uh, teaching somebody remotely. So the person, the learner is in the lower corner and, and she's in London and I'm in New York and you can do multi-user VR uh, to teach people things. As a surgical tool, um, we have, we're using uh, XR a little bit more frequently now, but again, you have to think about latency. How quickly does the XR respond to what you do as a surgeon? So as, as, as you get better 
um, performance on latency, you probably get better safety. And these are the people using these systems. Um, you use a lot of uh, XR technology, which is registered, mixed in real reality, um, using robotic navigation. So you have rendering input technology, you have screens, probes, markers, and pressure sensors in some cases. And you know, here's examples of what you can do with the robot. You can get a plan and you can make that plan happen with the robot because you're using a, basically a mixed reality system. And here's another, you know, finding how to put screws in. Our technology is changing. We're getting better glasses and better types of technologies. We're getting better headsets that are cheaper that people can use. Um, in uh, 2021 at New England Baptist, they did a first uh, MRT total hip replacement. Um, and then in uh, total knee, the first MR total knee was done in 2021. And we did one of those here too. So what can we do in the future with this? I think the future is really haptics. Um, having haptic technology that you can put on your body that can give you much more uh, realistic feedback when you're learning. Um, so this is a you know haptic glove that I think is really fascinating and Meta copied this design. Their initial cost was $500,000 and it went to, down to $40,000 once they started developing it. So these types of haptic technologies are getting better. So there's a lot of opportunity here with haptics. Can you do surgery with a robot, but you have the tactical sensation of doing the surgery remotely? Possibly, yes. So what are the barriers to this? Latency of, of how you know the, the, the inputs are sent back to the user uh, and to the robot, and then how much it costs. You know, they're using this a lot for big construction projects. And then the next question is micronization. You know, can this can we potentially just use a contact lens instead of a big headset uh, to get inputs? Um, obviously, there are some challenges here. How quickly can you get the contact lens to give you the information you need? How what kind of resolution do you get? What kind of accuracy do you get? Uh, how do you get a battery into this? Uh, I don't think we're there yet for surgery. So this is really the contact lens that exists now, and I don't think I would want to wear this. And this is the, the resolution that it gets. So we need to do a little better on this, but I think we're getting there. People are thinking about this. And I, I think about Star Trek all the time that I would like to go on the holodeck and do a surgery, you know, somewhere else, but then and, and have the full 360 degree experience. But again, you know, this is an aspirational goal. So our metaverse can be dangerous. Uh, we can have people trying to do bad. I'll just put it that way. You can have crime, bullying, abuse, cheating. So you have to be aware of this when you're using these technologies. So to wrap up, you know, I think the XR is here to stay, especially in medicine. There's a lot of potential in medical education. Um, we need better data integration and we need a lower cost to use these things. We need to improve technology more as we go along and it'll be a better tool. So there is a, a great potential as a tool. Um, we have to improve our technology, improve our latency, validate and, and make sure these, these things are safe. We have a role in creating these tools. We need content, we need funding. We need to lead the way and divine and validate the technology. And I think haptic and rendering technology is really the key and making things smaller and easier to use is, is a second key. So thank you very much for your attention. And we have time for questions later.